So um, we heard even today in the NSF talk uh, uh, about how computer science is affecting everything. And uh, there, there's a number of reasons why one way to get it in K through eight in particular is to bring it to the science classroom. And my example happens to be in, in um, biotech. Uh, but I, there are other examples you would want to do. And I want to emphasize this, is that I happen to be the one who can get to Germany, but I'm definitely not the only contributor to this project. Um, uh, a few of uh, uh, the APIs are Paolo Lipstein, I think some of you know Paolo. Uh, and um, uh, a German who could be here, uh, Ingmar uh, Riedel Kruse. Uh, and um, uh, this was a project with Stanford, three-year NSF uh, grant, um, but uh, Paolo has since left for Columbia, and Ingmar has since left for the University of Arizona. Uh, so in terms of the local <laughs> group, I'm, I'm kind of it, but we have a number of people on our team, and part of what we're doing is we're trying to start to work with community colleges. So uh, Dr. Nick Cap at Skyline College is going to try to have his uh, students involved in building these for the local high schools. So let me tell you a little bit more about what it is. Oh, there's just a few, all these people want to be mentioned, but I don't want to take too much time. But Ethan is a doctoral student at Stanford, and he did an amazing amount of wonderful programming on this project. Uh, okay, so what is, it, what is it? Okay, so it's a prototype inexpensive robot that's way too fragile to put on an airplane to Germany, um, which is why I'm going to use videos instead. Um, uh, the current version uses a, a, a Arduino Mega, and I'll um, talk a little bit about why it's not just a regular Arduino. It's based on Snap, and I can, an important part of the talk is to understand why Snap was absolutely the right choice. Uh, for this. Uh, for those of you who don't have a biotech background, that's um, uh, part of a 96 well plate that got cut off. They're 8 by, eight by 12 wells where you can put the drops of liquid to do experiments. Um, this is a very, very cheap syringe that you can buy at the drugstore, right? and we usually put a tip on it um, for, for doing pipetting. Uh, and these are called cubettes with different colored liquids in the little plastic things, and I think they're probably in the other you don't need to get them. We're not going to. In the, in, the, in the workshop version of the talk, we wanted people to actually try pipetting themselves to see what's involved, how hard it is. When we work with actual students, we always have them do that first. When they do their example, we have them actually write down the steps of a simple example. And then when they get to SNAP, they actually follow the steps. That's how they get started with, pro and for many, the first time ever programming in anything. Is, okay, so how basically I played turtle, how did I do it? Uh, so, so that's the idea. Okay, so it's QBAS, a long plate, obviously motors and sensors. Everything is open source. Everything is available. We're looking for partners who are brave enough to try to build one of these, and we we'll want to emphasize that we're not saying it's easy yet. If we had, this is the last of our three years from NSF, but if we had more money, which we're looking for, um, one of the main emphases would be making it more easy to build in a makerspace by the less skilled people. Um, um, so that's the front end. And all the material is on, it's laser cut plastic for the most part. There's a tiny bit of 3D printing. Um, and all the designs are in, um, uh, what do you call it, on shape. Uh, and all the software is in GitHub. So this is all stuff that you can look at and play with and improve. And um, uh, so. Here's the basic issue. In the United States, it's really, really hard to bring computer science to K-8. And you've heard the reasons at a couple of other talks. The teachers aren't prepared. The schedules are completely inflexible. Why? Because they're going to have a standardized test on math and a standardized test on English, and there is no time for anything else, right? Not music, not phys ed, not, certainly not computer science. And it's all about the test, right? So that's why, that's why we need this. Um, um, so, well, um, one thing is that you can bring computer science into the science classroom more easily than others. Unfortunately, the average amount of time that a student in the U.S. is in K through eight is getting science is maybe an hour every other week from a person called a TOSA, which is someone who circulates through the district who has maybe a bachelor's or a master's in a, in a scientific discipline. But because they're not part of that intensive standardized high stakes program, they're more open to innovation than, say, the math class. I mean, many of us want to bring this into the math class and music, and, and I think reaching kids where they are is really, really important. 
Um, but at least the science teacher is open to it. And one thing we've learned, going back to the days of Logo, if the teacher is not on board, it doesn't happen. You can't force it down their throat. They have to be excited, right? So science teachers tend to be. And of course, the main reason why this is good is you can't think about thinking without thinking about thinking about something. And that's me learning that from Seymour. <laughs> so, okay. Um, all right, so uh, more specific reasons for doing it. Project-based, inquiry-driven. It's cost-effective, or at least it can be cost-effective. The parts cost to build this is about $150. We would like to get it down, uh, but on the other hand, to make it more accurate and so on, we may have to actually go up a little. But that's less than the cost of a Lego kit. Right? And I'll talk a little bit about Lego kits shortly, because that was another option for doing it. Um, it's about computational thinking and robotics. It's authentic context, and it's not just building games or building vehicles. Okay? Um, and um, students experience how having better technology, it's sort of like the telescope story. Computer science is not about computers, and astronomy is not about telescopes, but seeing how better telescopes went to better astronomy. That's the analogy here. Okay? Um, okay. And then um, the reality you could work, for example, with um, a high school that has a biotech institute, um, and their students go off to Genentech during the summer to do internships. When they come back from the internship, the report says, really good lab skills, really under, good understanding of the basic science that we expect them to have, but why can't they program the robots? <laughs> that's, that's the way it's done now. So, um, all right, so, now this would have been a hands-on activity in a longer workshop to basically, okay, how do I actually put 0.1 milliliters of a liquid in each of 96, you know, um, uh, wells on a plate? Um, and then um, measure the color when I add another liquid to it and so on. So, um, and these are the kind of questions the students actually ask. You know, well, is it the same color? Did the color change? How many, how many milliliters or, or tenths of milliliters do I need to put in for the color to change? And would it be more fun if a robot did this tedious task, which takes a long time? Um, okay, so in middle school, um, I, mean, I mean, one of the things that happens right away that the, the girls notice is they can use the colors and they can make art. The boys maybe not so much, but but um, that's, uh, just doing color with them is fun. Uh, but what is actually in the curriculum for 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 science in middle school in the United States, uh, in most states, and as you know, it differs from state to state. Measurement and precision, repeating things but with variations. Um, uh, one is the relationship between density and layering of liquids, I and mean, the kids really enjoy being able to get the robot to make essentially a colored layer thing. Um, color theory. Um, the most recent one that we did that went really well was at the beginning of the summer, and a lot of the kids um, were interested in learning to get to go swimming. And so we brought pool samples in, and we had to measure the, the pH using the robot and show whether their measurement was replicable, and, and so on. Um, and uh, that was very, very well received. Okay. Um, high school it gets a little bit more complex. The high school is uh, a few blocks from my house. Every ninth grader does an experiment at the beginning of biology, which is, you know, one of the ways of meeting what are called the UC requirements. For those of you in the U.S. are probably very familiar with those. Um, you know, they take biology in ninth grade, and what they do in there is one of the things is they have to estimate the impact of the salinity um, of water on um, krill. And krill is basically whale food, right? Very small organisms, but they're big enough to count, right? So they make different cuvettes with different amounts of salinity and starting out with the same amount of krill in each one. And over time, they're counting to see how it goes down. And of course, what they're learning about is the impact of climate change, which a ninth grader can understand, but somehow, you know, a lot of nervous can. Um, uh, so hopefully these ninth graders will eventually be in Congress. Uh, so, um, Okay, so but in tenth grade, especially for example in um, something like this biotech institute in our uh, local high school, um, well, they all learn to do what's called a serial dilution. That's making a progressively less um, concentrated version of something. But in particular, they learn a, a laboratory procedure called the Denalyza. Uh, and the, the example that we have uh, involves um, horseradish peroxidase. The students learn to do this. It's very, very tedious. They have to use multiple well plates to do it well, and they have to be able to basically show that they didn't, you know, um, what do they call it, um, hard code their data. Um, 
they have to really do the experiment and show the results. Okay. And then the other thing is it can be used in, in fab lab kinds of activities, although we do have to make it a little easier to build than it is currently. Okay. Um, I'll skip that. That's the example of the curriculum that's actually used in our local high school on the Alonso procedure. Okay, so this goes back to actually before this NSF grant. Um, someone named Lukas Gerber, I believe also in German, <laughs> uh, um, uh, tried building an out of Legos at first um, and worked with um, Ingmar, so that's how that got passed along. And uh, so I have a video showing an early, early um, three axis version. And um, if some luck I can get to it or not. Well, I can try getting to it this way and see if it works. Okay, yes, please do it. Uh, of course, of course not. <laughs> so um, let's, let's do it this way. Uh, here we go. Uh, all right, so here is the um, three axis one. Okay. So this is the robot uh, made out of Legos. And what you do is you actually um, uh, super glue uh, the um, syringe to a Lego part, and then that allows you to add it into the rest of your, your Lego kit. Uh, this particular model can be made with. Um, one Lego kit. That was that was something that was promised to NSF that we could do that with, you know, with with, uh, with one Lego kit, not more. But that's still a three hundred and seventy-five dollars worth of parts situation. And the school doesn't really want to have, you know, for all the other classes that want to use Lego kits to have this be set up permanently, even though it took many hours to put together. Now we've done projects where, for example, um, the pipetter mechanism alone is built by middle school students, and they really enjoy doing that. Mm -hmm. And they can do that in a couple of hours. So, but to build the whole robot is, we take all the time building the robot and no time using it or programming. So, um, so that's the idea of that. Okay, now I wanna to go to the next one. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, okay, so this was the most elaborate version of this uh, the, um, with the Lego approach. And that is, um, it says 2D, but it's actually 4, 4D. It was a funny way of counting there. So um, as you can see, you could have you know, beakers, and you could have well plates, and you could have uh, lots of different things. And this um, was um, a nice you know, proof of accuracy and so on. So Gerber and, and all of our paper uh, published about it in PLOS and so on. But, but as far as being practical for schools, it's you know way too big and way way too complex. Uh, also way too expensive. I think there's about three Lego kits worth of parts in there, so that makes it a thousand dollar kind of item. Uh, and um, uh, also the programming, and this is this is one of the things that really drove me crazy. The programming is in this lab view like thing that somehow came along and replaced Lego logo. Why I'll never know. Uh, it's very bad for doing things like teaching kids about variables, you know. So we don't we don't like um, math. We could go on, right? <laughs> okay. So that uh, uh, because of time, we'll uh, we'll move we'll move we'll move back to the PowerPoint here. Uh, and uh, let's see, can we actually say uh, continue? Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay. So uh, those are the early ones. Okay. Uh, the next thing we tried is, well, you know, we could do a little bit better with um, a Raspberry Pi. I think everyone I've ever shown this to has said, have you considered using a Raspberry Pi? <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, and we, we, we used something called a Brick Pi because we were still trying to use the motors for Lego. Because one thing I will say about Legos is that the motors are extremely accurate and well done. Mm -hmm. right? And whereas we're using crappy motors, and that does make it harder. Um, Okay. So, um, and the great for students that we want them to learn Python, and I teach Python, I teach Python at Princeton University, um, but um, not necessarily the right first choice, certainly at the middle school level. SNAP is much more suited to what we want to teach, and it's part of it, we do not want the text programming to get in the way of learning the science. In order to sell this to the science teacher, they need to see that there's sort of a good balance Yes, they're learning some computer science, they're also getting to do real science. And if we have to spend a month teaching them Python before they can access the robot, it's over, right? So, but also the early, the early Brick Pi had reliability issues. Now, there is a high school that came to one of my talks and is going to build the 
the uh, Raspberry Pi version of it, and they're working on that now. Um, but we decided now, the heck with it, we're building our own, okay? Oh, I didn't, did I show you, I didn't show you that one, okay, but, all right. Um, so we said, let's use an Arduino. So very quickly, we realized that by the time we, we uh, loaded um, Fermata, um, we didn't have enough memory for the code to run the motors. So, um, uh, therefore, we thought, well, that's fine. We just need something with block-based programming as a front end for the students. So, and as those of you who were here for the previous one saw, the micro bit can be pretty nice for that. So we said, great, we'll use the micro bit for the student front end, and it will talk to an Arduino over the serial port, and the Arduino will drive the robot. All right, well, obviously, the, the software platform of the micro bit's somewhat limited. Um, the hardware is also somewhat limited. Um, terrible user interface. We literally were scrolling instructions by on the micro bits 5x5 five five display saying now do this, now do that, you know. Um, uh, and um, also we had serial port noise because one is 3 volts, one is 5 volts, whatever. So, but I do want to show you that one. Uh, let's see, so, here we go. Uh, so this is the micro bit version, just to give you an idea. So that's the micro bit. That's literally telling them, you know, to do this, do this, and they have to calibrate the robot and, and so on. And you can see the robot. Uh, now there's the first kind of plastic version of the robot, um, and the, the plastic sheets cost like two dollars. You know, they're, they're very inexpensive. But you can see the kind of hysteresis, sort of jittery stuff happening. Um, and there were probably several things causing that, but one of them was serial port noise because of the voltage difference between the two devices. So. Um, so we're wondering, okay, so how do we get this to something reasonable? And we had this wonderful graduate student, Ethan. He said, well, what if, what if I could put a, a subset of Fermata and still get Snap to work? Which, by the way, we should share that with everybody probably. Um, uh, and we still couldn't quite do it, but we said, well, there's this new thing called the, the, the Mega, the Arduino Mega. If we use the Arduino Mega and we do a subset of Fermata, we could fit it all on one thing. So that's where we go next, and uh, let me see if I can jump right to that. Uh, okay, uh, so, um, yeah, here we go. And, um, slide. okay, so uh, it's laser cut plastic, a little bit of 3D printing. Okay, we used the Mega to do the back end and the student user interface this time. Um, we got just enough of Vermont in there to get Snap to work. Um, it's actually Snap for Arduino, to be precise. Um, uh, we used one motor for each axis, and there's um, a three-axis version and a four-axis version, and you'll, you'll see what the difference is uh, in a second. Okay, now, underneath that, there's a low-level code, and there's some C from the Arduino, there's the JavaScript for getting from Snap to other stuff, and there's some Python because libraries already existed that saved us work. Right? One reason to use Snap, even if you're not going to teach all of the advanced features, is that to you as the developer, they're there. They're available. We could use launch. We could, we could use higher order function. We could do all the things that we needed to do to make something simple for the students. And my analogy is actually this early piece by Cynthia, which is called Teach. And even though the students might not be ready to use the things that were necessary to build Teach, it was there and Cynthia could do it. So, um, that's an important point that I don't think people understand. They say, well, this is scratch. This is for sixth graders. Um, they, don't, they don't need to do first class functions. Well, yeah, but if you're a teacher building curriculum, you might, you know? So, okay. So, um, and the students can actually do their own extensions in JavaScript. We haven't exercised that capability much yet, but uh, I expect we will. So the three motor version, okay? One of the directions is controlled um, by the student being told, move the trick. Right? But, it, but it, what, of course, the best one is the four motor version. That was the hardest one to cram on. That's why we really needed the, uh, the bigger thing. So the three motor version, we basically added these primitives. And yes, the one feature we want is the ability to have a new cluster of different colored blocks. This is the stuff for the robot. That's the feature we want. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
somewhat imperfect because you only could say what you want to go to in one dimension. And then the other dimension would say, please, please lift up this tray and move it to row whatever, right? And um, it works, but it's still kind of tedious. And so the benefit of automation isn't fully appreciated by the student. So um, uh, I'm going to skip showing you that one uh, for time purposes and show you the, the four-axis one. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and this is doing one of the standard So this is a, this is a, the main model that we're working with now. We have we have a modest number of these, so we can conduct small user studies, but not big ones. Runs on Azure Windows, does not currently run on Chromebooks, although I think maybe that hasn't been solved by the SNAP team no. actually. Um, so um, so you've got two rows of QBEX, and this is usually where your sources are and where your discards are, and then you have uh, 96 wells. Um, this tray goes back and forth, so that's one motor, okay? It also goes left and right, that's another motor. Okay, the entire mechanism moves up and down, and then the plunger inside the syringe moves up and down, so that's why it's, it's a four-motor system or a four-axis system. Uh, and um, uh, let me go ahead and show you how that goes. So. Over here you can see, that's lit, and so that you start by connecting the Arduino. We'd love it if that were a real block that we could actually put in our code, especially for Windows machines where the port changes every time. Mm -hmm. um, um, so you, you get some order from a cubet, right? and you, one of the things you learn is, well, the syringe can only hold so much, so if I'm trying to fill a whole lot of wells, I'm gonna have to go back a couple of times. And if I'm changing from one liquid to another, I need to rinse. We're debating about whether to provide rinse as a primitive or, or have the students realize they need to build a sub procedure called rinse. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, a lot of these arguments go all the way back to the early logo conversations is should we have arc or not? You know, same thing. So, um, uh, all right, so you can see that each time it's doing it, it's mixing it with the, with the water in the, in, uh, in the current one and then taking the weaker one to the next one and, and, and so on. Now, you can do this by hand. Uh, and this is only doing it eight times, and we sped it up, but it's really tedious to do that if you have to do a lot of them, right? Um, so, so this is all, all scratch code that a student can easily understand. This is, the, this is the scientific procedure that I'm trying to do. Now, the early ones actually had the Lego color sensors on it. So inaccurate, so terrible compared to their motors that we stopped doing automated color sensing, but it would be nice to be able to look at that and determine um, from the computer whether or not. So we will, that will drive the price up if we do that. That's the only trouble there. Okay, so let's do like that. We have two more minutes. And, Is that okay with uh, you? Question? Two more minutes? No. Two minutes, okay, good. Okay, well let me get, this is, this is one of the things I really wanted to get to. Why was Snap so helpful? Okay, uh, it has the accessibility of Scratch. I mean, I know I'm preaching in the corner. Um, um, but it's not as distracting from the science as Python or C would be. Yes, you could, pro you could, I can teach middle kids to program in C on an Arduino by basically copying and modifying little pieces of code, um, but that's not, they're not gonna spend much time on the science, okay? Um, uh, the lower level language interfaces were really helpful to us, okay? Um, we had a single device in the box instead of two different devices trying to talk to each other. Um, uh, it's completely, everything's open source, unlike the Lego API, one of the problems with Lego was we couldn't get to the newer motors because of the API being closed. Um, it's full featured. We used parallelism. Actually, our graduate student got so enthralled by the launch command that he reduced the accuracy for a while. I had to take some of the launches out because there was too much launch theory going on. <laughs> but um, uh, we captured a safe vector, a safe, you know, whatever. All the first class kinds of things you can do. Um, it's very convenient for improving the user interface. Um, I can't actually loaded here, I guess, but um, we now have a user interface that's almost a full simulation of what the robot's doing. You can see where the, where the um, syringe is relative to the well plate and how full it is and all of that stuff. 
And the goal, I have a graduate student at um, Northeastern who's doing an internship for me, and he's um, basically going to make it so even if you don't have the robot, it will still work. Now, one trick we might use is we might assume everybody has an Arduino when they just don't have the robot. And then, even though that's $35, because it makes programming the simulation much, much simpler. There's a million places in our code where it says if Arduino is connected, you know, so. Um, uh, so that, there's that, and we're able to teach mainstream computer science. Instead of the sort of data flow programming, we can teach about functions and procedures and variables, and, you know, um, so, so we love the computer science benefit of it. Um, okay, obviously we're not gonna do the activity, but in a, in a longer workshop, you could have actually programmed that. So there's a lot of questions that come to mind, right? Um, uh, does, it, does it matter what grade, as far as this is more useful for middle school or for for high school, um, uh, is it work? Here's a, the null hypothesis is, um, I've taken time away from the science, so therefore the science performance might go down. Okay? But actually, because you're getting, first of all, you're getting a, um, a, a gain in terms of the speed that it can do it, right? But the other thing is the engagement's going up. So our claim is, no, actually, you're gonna get some computer science learned and more science learned. We do think there's an effect on um, inclusiveness, and I'll, I'll give you an example of that uh, in my last 30 seconds, probably. Um, uh, and is it robust enough? I would say we've pretty much proven that it's robust enough for middle school and not yet robust enough for high school because you have to have a lot of accuracy to do an ELISA or something like that. And the teachers want to use it. So far, the answer to that has been overwhelmingly, when can you come to work at school? Here's a bunch of pilot studies we did. Um, um, this is a really interesting one about inclusiveness. Krista McCullough School, named after the astronaut. It's in Saratoga, which for those of you who know the Bay Area, it's a lot of vice presidents from Apple's kids. But amazingly enough, um, we, we ran into situations where they had no, I mean, the kids that came had no prior exposure to either robotics or programming of any sort, even though you know, their parents work for Apple. And usually it's both parents work for Apple in order to pay for a mortgage there. Um, so we had a room and we had a total of about 30, 40 kids with another teacher. The other teacher was doing traditional Lego robotics okay, with LabVIEW with the object to build a vehicle that could, you know, move autonomously and maybe crash into other vehicles on purpose, right? Or you could do um, liquid handling robot. And we talked to the girls and the boys and what their interests were, and we let them choose, because okay, it's student voice. And guess what? Every girl, every girl chose liquid handling and robot. Every boy chose building the vehicles. Now, I had, I mean, that's a, this is a small sample. We had, you know, I think 10 girls all together, eight to 10 girls, something like that. Um, so you can't overgeneralize from this. But I, I interviewed them individually to what, you know, what was the difference? And they, well, it seems like this could help you do things like cure cancer. Okay. The boys are not mature enough to have that thought yet. The girls are at middle school. The girls mature faster, right? The boys are going, oh man, we can smash stuff together. This is great, <laughs> you know? The, the girls are, wow, we could do something good for the world. Maybe this computer science thing isn't so bad. So I think it's important, um, and obviously we need to do more studies. Um, what surprised us, we also went to a school much, you know, much less well endowed in terms of the parent community, and whoop, okay. Um, turned out they all had prior exposure to Python, but that's the one where we did the assets and bases, which was right before they were having that as their lesson in class anyway. And the teacher was like, yes, great. It's the first time they're excited about doing assets and bases. So we did high school studies. I, because of time, will not um, go into that. Um, uh, and we have two high schools that are trying to build versions of it. We're not going to do group conversations. But what do we want to do? We want to improve the engineering design. We're trying to keep the parts cost around $150. Um, we need to support a simulation only mode because there will never be as many robots as there are kids in the room. They should still be able to work on their projects. And we always do pair programming anyway. Um, uh, we need to do larger studies. Um, we have to support Chromebooks or it's dead in the US. That's just the reality. It has to support Chromebooks. 
Um, don't get me started. <laughs> Where's your hand? Yeah, okay, okay, there you go. Um, Rabbi Nassim um, uh, But a big thing is we're trying to figure out if it, right now it's too hard for most high school students to build, although I do have one example where they did pretty well with it. Um, it it's, it's more like if you have community college kids and a good instructor, they can build it. And they can build it for the local high schools. And that's actually kind of a movement in a lot of parts of the US already to involve the community colleges with the high schools in that sort of way. Um, we need better documentation. If you try to build it, stay in touch with us and, and we will try to help. Um, okay, and obviously you can join our Slack channel, you can send me an email. All of these slides are available. Um, and these are other contributors. Uh, everything is there. It's, it's, um, it's a link that takes you to the Google Drive folder. And, and please take a look and please reach out. If you try to do something with it, let us know because there's you know always changes and improvements and we want to you know give you the best